This is Wilkins Chapter 9, Documentation for Dental Hygiene Care. Um, the maintenance of complete records uh, for every aspect of care provided for each patient is really a key aspect of our dental hygiene practice. So patient records uh, can be kept, kept in a lot of different ways, both handwritten, electronic, a uh, combination of both. A lot of offices have combinations or have gone paperless at this point. So an essential factor for legal documentation of all aspects of dental hygiene care include record keeping that is chronological, that means each entry is dated, systematic, comprehensive, accurate, unaltered, as well as signed by you, the dental hygienist. So the dental hygiene process of care is something that we do for each of our patients. And documentation of the patient care is really an integral component of each step of the dental hygiene process of care. So every step in the process is documented in each patient record at the initial appointment and then at every continuing care appointment. Comprehensive accurate and concise documentation of each step forms a complete and chronological record for the patient's oral health status and treatment over time. There are some ethical applications. A dental hygienist may be involved in a variety of moral, ethical, and legal situations related to documentation of patient information during practice. And understanding that the patient record can be uh, subpoenaed in the event of litigation is a basic tenant of ethical and legal risk management for professional practice. And you will be taking a number of courses as a registered dental hygienist on how to protect yourself, the dentist, and the practice from being sued. And a lot of it comes back to proper record keeping. So knowledge of and adherence of the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA, requirements for privacy and security of the patient records is really important. So an overview of the key concepts in patient record keeping and an explanation of examples of ethical applications are found on Table 3-1 of your textbook. So take a look at those. This is an outline of uh, what we're going to be talking about. Okay, it's the patient record. Uh, the purposes and characteristics of uh, the components of the patient record, the handwritten record, as well as the electronic record, uh, HIPAA as well, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, documenting all the various steps in our process of care. So you can see that there is the E, EIE, which is the extraoral, intraoral examination, tooth numbering systems, charting, periodontal records, dental records, care plan records, informed consent, and documentation. So yes, we are going to be discussing each of these. Learning objectives, you can um, refer to Blackboard, and they are here as well. And this is the table 3-1 that has the uh, ethical record keeping. Look at the concepts, privacy, confidentiality, security, accuracy, authenticity, and impersonal and objective data. Now, this is what a proper record should contain. For privacy, the patient has the right to control access to uh, who looks at their health record. We do guarantee confidentiality. Uh, we need to protect against unsecured patient data. So we need to let the patients know that their records will be secure. Accuracy, uh, unaltered. And that's the big key. You can't go back and alter something after you've written it. You can make an addendum but you can't cross anything out, erase, that type of thing. And we'll get into, for handwritten as well as electronic records, how to um, make corrections. Authenticity, only data actually obtained during the patient's visit is reported. So you can't backdate anything. Well, I know they were healthy. I didn't do a perio charting, but I'm just going to go ahead and make up these numbers and say I did it because. Uh, and I've seen that happen in practice. 
It also needs to be impersonal and objective. So the personal opinion or negative social observations um, that aren't pertinent to the patient's treatment aren't placed in the patient record. So uh, we used to have um, put in little notes along the side of the margins that Johnny is going to college, Susie's getting married, and the that type of documentation on personal things does not go into their treatment records. Sticky notes can be made. There's a notes section also in the electronic chart, so you can put the, that personal stuff in there, but it's not part of the record per se. So let's take a look at the patient record. Um, the purposes and characteristics, you've got your patient uh, health records that really provide a means of communication between the members of the health team, that's you and the doctor, as well as with their patients. So it needs to be um, complete and accurate, and a complete patient care record really does facilitate coordinated planning as well as continuity of care. Patient records um, serve as a basis for the evaluation of the quality of care and really aid when a review is made for the effectiveness of care. Did it work? Did my treatment, did our treatment plan work? Did it take you out of pain? Is it bringing you to a healthier status? So data from the health records are utilized in research as well as education. Documentation in the patient's record is considered legal evidence for any legal or forensic situation. Documentation in the patient record is authentic. It needs to be genuine, accurate and comprehensive, legible, as well as objective. The patient record entries are recorded promptly during or following treatment. So it's not advisable that you wait till the end of the day to write up all your records because you will forget things. Trust me on that one. Um, you can record using clear, concise, subjective statements. A lot of physicians record and have a transcriber um, actually type them into uh, the patient records. It needs to be dated and it needs to be signed by the clinician and that's you and you're going to be used to signing everything with how we've got this um, program set up for you. So the components of a patient record, so the format of patient records are going to vary from office to office and practice to practice and clinic to clinic. All the information collected during the initial examination and during continuing care um, appointments is an official part of the patient's permanent record. So to meet the dental hygiene standard of care, all the components of the dental hygiene process of care are addressed, including the dental hygiene care plan, that is your treatment plan for the patient. The required components of a complete and regularly updated patient record include a medical history, vital signs, a dental history, clinical assessment, as well as diagnosis, treatment recommendations and written treatment plans, progress notes for each patient visit, as well as signed acknowledgement of confidentiality measures, and that's the HIPAA, okay, and we're going to be talking about that later on in this chapter. Additional components of a patient record are required when applicable include informed consent, radiographs and radiographic assessment, periodontal risk assessment, caries risk assessment, trauma, surgery, um, anesthesia records, study models, oral photographs. Uh, a lot of offices, most offices have an intraoral camera and they want you, that your employers will want you using that technology. Orthodontic records if applicable, lab orders as well as the lab results, and referral records as, as well as copies of um, consultation correspondence with specialists or medical practitioners. So each component of the patient record is marked with a patient identification or demographic information. Now for the handwritten record, historically the dental health uh, care personnel have maintained handwritten documentation of patient records. And handwritten records are re need to be legible and written in ink. Records 
have also been dictated into machines to be typewritten into a permanent record later. But mistakes are corrected. If you have a handwritten record, mistakes are corrected by placing a single line through the error, writing the correct information immediately after, and then signing the entry. Some offices will have you date and sign the entry as well. So what needs to show through is what the original statement or the error was. Otherwise, it looks like you're trying to hide something. And again, you always want to think of this record being on a huge projector in front of a court and a jury. What is it going to look like to somebody who doesn't know what was going on? So if a late entry is necessary and new information is, needs to be recorded, it needs to follow the most recent entry in the patient record. It's noted as a late entry and dated, as well as time stamped, especially for the um, electronic records. Systems may involve the completion of forms with topics or spaces um, to check off or spaces for writing descriptive information or for prose style summaries. And that's what we have with the Dentrix. We have made templates for each component of the process of care and you fill in the template. That way everybody is doing the exact same thing and writing it up the exact same way. So strict uh, infection control really needs to um, be adhered to, whether it's paper or electronic charting, so there's no contamination of the paper records, especially during uh, patient care. For written records, a filing system is needed that provides accessible accessibility to healthcare records by authorized personnel only. So healthcare records need to be locked. For the electronic record, uh, they're computerized and uh, they can provide a faster, more convenient, and better organized mode of information. Uh, the data can be accessed from anywhere within the system by authorized personnel. There's usually a password involved. And there's a variety of software programs that are available. We at uh, Medical Education Campus, as well as Germana, use Dentrix, which is one of a, uh, the popular ones. There's EagleSoft, SoftGent. There are a number of different programs. And once you know one, it's fairly easy to figure out how the other ones work because they have a lot of similar characteristics. But the systems provide methods for documenting um, dental and periodontal assessments. They can be voice activated, automated, or sometimes you have to manually oftentimes um, input the data with the keyboard, but they do require computer terminals where only authorized personnel can access the required information. And again, uh, with the patient privacy, these computer monitors should ideally be directed away from the view of unauthorized persons. And that's really hard to do in a dental clinic when you have a long row of chairs and uh, patients being seen. So it's important that when you're not working with your patient that everything be minimized and you're not leaving any personal information, including radiographs, just sitting on the computer screen. Infection control is also something to consider. There needs to be plastic barriers on the computer keyboard as well as the mouse and <coughs> disinfect the chair side monitors if it's a touch um, system and you need to move the computer screen because of the swivel arm, wherever you're touching needs to be disinfected or barriered. There are specifically designed software and record storage systems that can standardize technology. Uh, and again, we use the Dentrix here. And I think you'll be very pleased with, um, with our program. So let's talk a little bit about health insurance Portability and Accountability Act. That's HIPAA, all right? It um, started in 1996. And the effect for dental practices uh, in the United States was in effect in April of 2003. And the whole 
aim of this is to protect patient records and other health-related information. Uh, the law applies to healthcare facilities, <coughs> excuse me, healthcare insurance companies, and healthcare providers. Now, some states may have stricter laws that take uh, precedence over the federal standards. So, whichever one is stricter takes precedence. Legislation is in place in Canada, for example, and some European countries to protect the privacy of personal information. So the current law is divided into two separate components that address the privacy and the patient's ability to access health, health information, as well as the security of the patient's uh, information in healthcare settings. <coughs> there is the HIPAA privacy rule that establishes a national standard to protect individual privacy, as well as access to medical records and other health information. So the patients have the right to receive a copy of their personal health records, as well as ask to change incorrect or incomplete information. So the HIPAA privacy rule, it establishes a national standard to protect individuals' privacy and access to medical records. The patient has a right to, as we said, receive a copy. They can ask to change correct or incorrect information or incomplete information. And they can decide in some cases, such as marketing, whether the health information can be shared. Uh, they can ask to be contacted regarding health information in a specific location or by a specific method like telephone or mail. They can file a complaint with the provider, health insurer, um, the United States government regarding concerns about the use of their health information. And the health care facilities are responsible to develop um, privacy and confidentiality forms to adopt written privacy policies as well as educate the staff about confidentiality and patient information and appoint a staff privacy officer and privacy contact person. Um, we are also responsible to provide patients with a notice of privacy practices um, document at the beginning of their care and receive signed acknowledgement of the receipt. So a lot of this is, is HIPAA. They're signing the HIPAA form and patients are well aware of this. Once they sign it, they only need to do that once unless there are major changes or substantive changes within how that particular facility is going to handle the patient privacy. Uh, but again, the healthcare facility needs to implement security measures, policies, and formal protocols that protect patient information establish sanctions for workforce members who fail to comply with the policies, and healthcare providers are responsible to comply with the protocols and policies that have been set up by whatever facility you are in. There's the HIPAA security rule, and that was updated in 2013 to strengthen digital security standards as well as enhance enforcement. So it establishes a national set of security standards for protecting health information that is held or transferred in the electronic form. And it comprises three separate standards, administrative safeguards, physical safeguards, and technical safeguards. So administrative safeguards is the limitation of access to appropriate members of the workforce. It shouldn't be open to anybody walking by. Physical standards, the use of storage systems and procedures that prevent access of unauthorized individuals. So a lot of the chart rooms are locked. As well as technical standards, and that's the use of technology such as coding and encryption, encryption excuse me, to control access of patient information. So a lot of offices are emailing copies of um, images, you know, the x-rays that they've taken. And um, unless the email is encrypted, that is against the HIPAA security rule. And the problem with encryption is that you might be encrypted, but if I send it to another facility that doesn't have that encryption code, they can't open the document. 
So to get around that, offices are just ignoring the security rule. How we get around it at NVCC is we don't email the records, uh, but what we'll do is we'll make a disk and give the patient the disk of images and any records that they want. And that will satisfy the security rule. Documentation for the extra and intra-oral examination. Um, it's a specific objective of the, we call it EOIO, for um, extra oral, intra oral um, examination. And again, we have a template for that because we need to uh, have careful and thorough documentation of the findings. And we will make you mark down normal as well as variation of normal in any pathology that you might note because we want you to have a, a trained eye and this is just starting you to make sure that you're looking at everything you're supposed to be looking for. There are different numbering systems and we're going to be getting into this uh, in more detail in oral anatomy but uh, we'll just go over this uh, very quickly here. There's the continuous or universal numbering system, which is 1 through 32. That's what we use. There's the FDI two-digit as well as the quadrant numbers. And after you're done with oral anatomy, you will seamlessly be able to convert one system to the other. And depending on where you work in um, private practice, be it oral surgery, orthodontics, they might use a different numbering system. Uh, the United States seems to be the um, main users of the continuous or universal numbering system. So for permanent teeth for the continuous numbering system, um, it starts with the upper maxillary right, okay, maxillary right third molar, that's the wisdom tooth, is number one. Then it goes all the way around the arch to the maxillary left wisdom tooth, which is number 16, drops down to the mandibular left wisdom tooth, number 17, and follows around to the right side, which is number 32. So those are numbers. For the deciduous or primary or baby teeth, um, it follows the same sequence, only they use letters, A through T. So that differentiates permanent versus deciduous. Now for the FDI system, that's the Federation Dentaire Internationale, um, also called the international system, uh, for permanent tooth, each tooth is numbered by quadrants. And you have four quadrants. A quad is four, right? So the upper right, maxillary right, is quadrant number one. Maxillary left is quadrant number two mandibular left, quadrant number three, and mandibular right, quadrant number four. So the first number is that quadrant. And the starts with the midline, okay, for the individual tooth numbers, starting at the center. So your central incisor is number one. The lateral incisor next to that is number two. And it goes all the way to the third molar or wisdom tooth, which is number eight. So there's two digits that are pronounced separately. So for example, um, the continuous numbering system or universal numbering system has a tooth number 25. That is the mandibular um, a central incisor, mandibular right central incisor. But there is in the FDI system a 2-5, which is the maxillary left, okay, it's the second quadrant, second premolar. And there is a 4-2, which is the mandibular right lateral incisor. So tooth number 25 could be a 2-5, or it could be number 25. So you have to know what numbering system is being used. And some will have, instead of a 2-5, they'll put a 2.5, and that uh, point in the middle uh, designates the FDI system. For primary or deciduous teeth, the quadrants are continually uh, continued to be numbered. We've got one, two, three, four for the permanent dentition, then we have five, six, seven, eight for the deciduous dentition, and then there are the teeth starting with the central incisor for that. 
So you can have an H3, for example, and that's the maxillary, I'm sorry, the mandibular right primary canine, quadrant number eight, the third tooth within that quadrant. I'm really getting you confused now, huh? All right, then there is the Palmer system, right? And that is the quadrant system. So each, for permanent teeth, each tooth is designated using the numbers, okay? Number one is the central incisor. Number eight is the third molar, similar to how the FDI was. And the appropriate quadrant for each tooth is designated using a specific pattern or vertical or horizontal line. So there is a um, let me see here. I'm trying to figure out my markup tools and it's not working. All right, so we've got something like that, and then we'll have a tooth number inside. So this is the quadrant, and then the tooth number goes inside. So that is the quadrant system. Then we've got our, um, you need to know how the office is doing it. Uh, and then we've got our charting, and the purpose of each type of charting is defined by its title. You've got your dental chart, your periodontal chart. The dental and periodontal charts need to be updated. Okay, so the dental chart includes a diagram of the teeth, which indicates clinical features of the gum tissue and bone level. And the use of a separate chart for both hard tissue and soft tissue is recommended. So on periodontal charts are updated routinely on new forms with current dates to record changes in the patient's oral features over time. So it's important that if you're doing handwritten records that, there is, uh, that they are neat, that the symbols are identifiable, and everybody knows what the symbols and numbers mean. It is not appropriate to go and check the last entry, to, for especially for periodontal charting, to see if there's any changes. And then just putting a new date on it. It should be new numbers being entered each time and not just updating the record. But these are used in our care planning. So the uh, charting is a graphic representation of the existing conditions in the patient's mouth. It drives our treatment during dental and dental hygiene appointments. We're looking at the charting for useful guidelines for specific procedures. We use it to evaluate the outcome. Did our treatment work? We use it for protection in the event of any misunderstanding by a patient or if legal questions should arise um, in the records and what we've charted is what we use, as well as identification. In the event of an emergency, an accident, or a disaster, a patient may be identified by the teeth, by their dental records, and you've seen that, CSI and, and uh, you know, Criminal Minds and all of those shows. Um, they use dental records, and there are a lot of really interesting courses on forensics that you'll be able to take in your career. Um, so the forms used for charting, many variations exist depending on the charting system. Uh, they all have the specific components that are the same. They need to be neat, accurate, and complete. Label as needed for clarifi clarification. Um, there are anatomic drawings of teeth that you can actually draw in the restorations, etc., as you see them. There's geomet geometric drawings as well, and that looks, uh, it's a circle with um, each surface um, being, it almost looks like a pie chart. But the sequencing for charting, 
always has the patient's name, oftentimes the date of birth, patient identification, the date of the exam, so every entry is dated. Missing teeth is one of the first things that uh, is charted. Then there's a systematic procedure, and that's the use of a set routine that is really key to make sure you don't forget anything, and that's what seeing patient after patient after patient will do. Think about the first time you tried driving. I mean, you had so many things you had to think about, and now it's just a matter of habit. You don't even think about it. And that's by the time you graduate, that's where you will be with all of these. Right now, you're going to have to think about everything, painfully so. But it does get easier, I promise you. So charting one, um, all of one item is really recommended instead of taking one tooth and charting everything on that tooth. So it's recommended that you, for dental charting, record all the restorations first. Then start again on the first tooth and chart all the deviations from normal. Then start again and chart all, you know, of that type of thing. You can use the radiograph to help with the charting to, um, for missing teeth, uninterrupted impacted teeth, root canal or endodontic treated restorations overhanging margins, um, carious lesions, especially interproximal surfaces between the teeth, you can use uh, radiographs for. And when you have the hard tissue being checked by the supervising dentist in clinic, they will want those x-rays or the images brought up on the computer screen. Now, the periodontal record and the dental charting go hand in hand. In clinic, we do the period, we take radiographs, then we do the periodontal charting, and then the hard tissue charting. Because a lot of times the dentist is busy and can't get to you right away, so if the periodontal charting is already checked, that allows you to move on with treatment and not wait for the, the dentist. Um, so typically what we do in clinics, you'll do the periodontal charting, then the hard tissue. A lot of students do them together as one. Sign up for the uh, dental hygiene faculty to do the periodontal charting. Sign up for the dentist to do the hard tissue. They know they're the third, fourth person waiting in line for the dentist. So then they can go on to the next step in the process of care, which is finally using disclosing solution and taking a plaque index. And sometimes that is the second or third appointment that the patient's been there, depending on if you needed to take a full set of radiographs. So periodontal records, this is what we do. Um, we use clinical observations of the gingiva. Uh, you are going to be doing this on each and every patient. Now, our clinic rule is you only probe or measure completely erupted permanent teeth. And again, we'll get into this stuff in clinic. So if you've got somebody with mixed dentition, uh, a nine-year-old, or if you've got a four-year-old in the chair, you're not probing those deciduous teeth or the baby teeth. So it makes things go a little bit faster. Um, but it is a permanent record. And you want to prepare the entries, again, that everybody can understand. So after the periodontium has been brought to a state of health, you do your initial findings. Then you treat the patient, you work on their oral hygiene self-care, then you bring the patient back and you have to do an assessment. Are they healthy? Are they brought back to a state of health? Is there still infection going on? If there is, why is it? Is it because of their oral hygiene? Is it because there's calculus still there? Is it a plaque retentive surface? So you are playing detective. But you are always clinically observing that gingiva. You're looking for the description of the gingiva, the color, size, position, shape, consistency, surface, texture. And Wilkins, when we get into the periodontal assessment chapter, has a lot of those terms for you already, as well as the clinic health section in uh, Blackboard. You're going to describe the distribution of gingival changes. And this is where the computerized charting systems help, because you can compare one perio charting to another, and it will let you know the changes in the numbers. Are things localized or generalized? Again, with perio charting, it's missing teeth. Where are the bridges, the pontics, the implants, 
where is the gingival line or the gingival margin in relation to that tooth as well as that mucogingival line or the mucogingival junction? Is there an adequate zone of attachment there? Or do they have mucogingival defects? You will be charting all the probing depths. There are six of them. Um, we will get into dental implants later to probe or not to probe. Um, you do want to check the health of the gingiva around an implant, but you're not really um, necessarily concerned about the number that you're getting. You're looking for percation involvement. You're looking for the frenum attachments. Are there uh, any abnormal frenum attachments? Is it creating recession? You're looking for mobility, frematis. You're looking at the stains and describing those. Extrinsic stain, you're recording the uh, um, type of stain, the color, the distribution, location. Is it slight, moderate, or heavy? Intrinsic stain, you're, uh, there's a separate place for that. You're not going to be able to scale or polish intrinsic stain off because it's part of the tooth. Food debris, food traps, you're describing that. Dental biofilm, you're taking a plaque index using a disclosing solution and actually having a number, a percent, for the um, plaque score. Calculus, again, you're recording the distribution and amount. Super gingival on top of the gum, sub gingival underneath the gum. You're recording um, the distribution, slight, moderate, heavy, generalized, localized. You're looking for clinical signs of uh, occlusal trauma, so you are looking at occlusion. You're checking mobility of the teeth. You're checking for frematis, which is, um, uh, we'll discuss in chapter 20 as well, but it's where you have the patient tap their teeth in a normal bite, tap, 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 up and down, up and down, and your fingers are on their front teeth and you're checking for vibration there. You're checking for food impaction areas that, especially uh, where fibrous food is concerned, you're not only asking the patient about food traps, but you're going to be seeing them too. A big half a stalk of celery sometimes can get caught in between teeth. Um, you're using dental floss to identify contact areas that might be too tight or too open. You're looking for occlusion related habits. You're observing and looking for evidence and questioning the patient. You're looking at the x-rays or radiographs. You're noting wear facets or wear patterns. You might be taking study models. You're noting attrition, tooth to tooth wear. You're looking at the radiographs. Again, checking for signs of occlusal trauma. So for that, you need to have a good set of radiographs. You're looking at the height of bone checking to see if there's horizontal or angular or vertical bone loss in between the teeth. You're looking for um, the crestal lamina dura, which we'll be getting into and you'll be learning about in radiology, percation involvement, widening of the periodontal ligament space also. That can tell you whether or not the patient has some biting issues. And you're looking at overhanging restorations and carious lesions, those type of things. That's just the periodontal charting. And so the dental records, again, are um, varied from office to office and software to software. And you'll be having some experiences in um, this dental charting this semester. All of this is done before we come up with a treatment plan, and we do a dental hygiene care plan. So along with the comprehensive dental treatment um, plan, you also have a dental hygiene care plan. What can you, the hygienist, do for this patient within your scope of practice? Their treatment plan is going to involve, it might involve surgery, implants, uh, restorations, and everything, but that's outside of our scope of practice. Our dental hygiene care plan is what can we do? What kind of uh, scaling appointments does the patient need? What kind of oral hygiene instruction does the patient need? And we're going to be getting into that a little bit further. But the dental hygiene care plan includes dental hygiene diagnostic statements. Okay? We are not diagnosing the patient. We are not saying they have 
a certain condition because that is a diagnosis. But a diagnostic statement is patient appears to have um, plaque-induced gingivitis as evidenced by a plaque index of 76% um, biofilm along the gingival margins, and then you're describing the swollen edematous, puffy gum tissues that bleed easily and that type of thing. Uh, it all leads to plaque-induced gingivitis, but that is the dental diagnosis, not the dental hygiene diagnosis. Anyway, these are part of the patient care plan. And finally, we've got informed consent. We don't do anything with our patient until they understand what they ha the condition they have, what we want to do for them, options of what we want to do, as well as there's always the option to do nothing. And they have to understand what the risks and benefits are. Now, the risks of not doing anything could be you're going to lose your teeth. They have to understand that because it is up to them whether they choose to initiate treatment. So the essential components of a patient progress note, everything we've talked about, okay? Ending with the signature of the clinician as well as the date. So we're going to document each visit. The purpose is uh, to uh, be completed hopefully during or immediately following the patient visit. It's sometimes referred to as progress note. And uh, the essentials of a good progress note, the dental hygiene progress note, really document all aspects of the dental hygiene process of care and records interactions between the patient as well as the practice. So in addition to documentation about treatment rendered, the essential components of a patient progress note is um, that each entry in the patient record is dated and signed by the clinician, and the use of unique abbreviations that are not easily understood by others really can cause some clinical and legal issues. So you want to make sure that everybody is using the same acronyms um, or abbreviations. And there's medical terminology, abbreviations, an S with a line over it means without, a C with a line over it means with. That's medical terminology. Um, I was in one practice where a colleague of mine put P-A-B in capital letters. And I had to go to her and say, what is this? I'd never seen it before. And she goes, oh, that's Proxibrush. I made it up because I didn't want to write, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I didn't know what it was. So that's when you get into touchy situations. So you want to make sure everybody's using the same abbreviations. And we subscribe to the American Dental Association abbreviations. So I think there's something in your clinic health that has, um, has a list of those. So information um, is, needs to be included uh, that is concise and accurate. You don't want to make any derogatory statements. Uh, you don't want information about the financial matters, uh, professional dispute, legal actions, and risk management protocols in their treatment record. Now, it could be there's another uh, place for them that patient wants to hold off getting the implant until the next calendar year when they meet their deductible. You know, that type of thing is related to treatment, but that doesn't go in the treatment record. Um, there is a separate spot for that. And another systematic documentation is the SOAP approach. And SOAP has been around forever, but in some offices use it. I've been in offices where one doctor used it and another didn't, and ugh. Anyway, it's a systematic, standardized approach to writing patient progress notes, and it assures that really no details are missing and everybody does it the same way. So many um, clinicians develop their own systematic approach, uh, and that's fine too. Uh, there are several formalized documentation systems. Again, we have templates, which a lot of offices have, where you just fill in the boxes, and everybody fills in the same boxes. But SOAP means SOAP, subjective, objective, assessment or analysis, and the P is for 
procedures. So we've got a table here that gives you some examples of the SOAP. So look over that. Now look at the objective. The subjective is the patient's age. Well, you'd think that would be an objective thing, but we don't know if they're really telling us the truth on how old they are. Patient's gender, uh, the type of appointment schedule, they think they're here for a cleaning, but they really are in pain, and that needs to be addressed first. Medical history findings provided by the patient, again, subjective. Are they fully disclosing everything? The patient's chief complaint, why are you here today? The patient's self-care regime, you know everybody can say that they floss every day, whether they do or not as well as their social history. They might not fully disclose. So the objective are characteristics that you observed during the examination, and you don't want to confuse those with the assessment analysis. Head and neck examination findings, periodontal exam findings are objective. The uh, bleeding and the bleeding index, the soft tissue, the hard tissue, radiographic findings, comparison from one visit to the next. The A is for assessment analysis. And that is the identification of problems or patient needs. So that is your risk, um, uh, your, your, what am I trying to say? I just lost my thing. My, your risk uh, assessments. You've got your caries risk assessment, your periodontal disease risk assessment level. You've got lots of risk assessments that you can do um, to predict future needs for the patient. And then, You've got your P for procedures, interventions, performed, or planned. So understand what SOAP is. And then we've got things to teach the patient. So each of these Wilkins chapters ends with factors to teach the patient. Because our whole goal is to educate the patient and uh, increase their level of knowledge, not only about how to care for themselves, but what we are doing for them. It's not just 